Good morning, Dr. Phil here. Today we'll be discussing on defibrillation. Mechanism of action of a defibrillator. Definitions. A defibrillator is a device that delivers electrical energy to the heart causing simultaneous depolarization of an adequate number of myocardial cells to allow a stable rhythm to be established. Types of defibrillators include automated external defibrillators, manual defibrillators, and implanted cardiac defibrillators. Components of manual defibrillators include an on-off switch, controls for Joe setting, charge buttons, discharge buttons, sync button, etc. External pedals or pads, typically 8 to 8.5 cm in size, disposable adhesive defibrillator electrode pads, offers hands-free defibrillation compared to pedals, ECG oscilloscope, and paper recording facilities. Defibrillation is defined as the arrest of fibrillation of the cardiac muscle, atrial or ventricular, with restoration of the normal rhythm if successful. Principles of electricity. Can you refer to the video on principles of electricity for further details? The defibrillator circuit. 4,000 to 6,000 volts is applied across the capacitor to create a store of electrons once the charge button is pressed. A step-up transformer converts mains 240 volts to 5,000 volt AC. AC is converted to DC by a rectifier. DC is used instead of AC as it is more effective, causes less myocardial damage, and is less arrhythmogenic. In the absence of mains AC supply, most defibrillators will use DC supply from internal rechargeable batteries, which is converted to AC by an inverter, then amplified to 5000 volts DC by a step-up transformer and rectifier. A variable step-up transformer is used to select the desired voltage. The defibrillator is activated when the shock button is pressed. The stored charge from the capacitor is released as a pulse of current across the patient's heart. The stored energy is expressed in joules rather than volts. One joule equals the work required to move a charge of one coulomb through a potential difference of one volt, or one volt times one coulomb. Role for inductance. Inductance is provided by the inductor coil in the output circuit. Inductance decelerates the rapid discharge of the capacitor to give a shock that is slowed to 4 to 10 milliseconds. This prolonging of the effective delivery of current optimizes the chances of synchronous myocardial depolarization. The displayed energy is that delivered, not that stored. The amount of energy delivered by a defibrillator can be calculated as E energy equals C capacitance times voltage to the power of 2 divided by 2. However, not all of this energy is delivered to the patient every time. Defibrillators deliver DC to the myocardium to treat ventricular fibrillation, pulseless ventricular tachycardia, and tachyarrhythmias. Electrical current causes ion shifts within myocardial cells. This causes a disruption of ion gradients, resulting in a state similar to the refractory period. The heart's normal automaticity and sinus rhythm may be restored during this refractory period. Measures to achieve successful defibrillation the defibrillator must deliver DC to the myocardium over a short period. A high voltage is required to provide adequate current flow during defibrillation as the transthoracic impedance with large surface area defibrillator pads is 50 to 150 ohms. Most of the current is dissipated through the resistance of the skin and the rest of the tissues. Only a small part of the total current, about 35 amps, flows through the heart. The efficiency of the applied shock is greater if transthoracic impedance is minimized by the use of conductive gels, firm pedal pressure is applied, defibrillation from front to back rather than from sternum to apex, and repeated administration of shocks in quick succession if administered reduces impedance. Implantable automatic internal defibrillators is a self-contained diagnostic and therapeutic device placed next to the heart. Components include battery, electric circuitry and pulse generator sealed with battery and implanted under the skin, such as near the shoulder, and insulated wires threaded through blood vessels 
from the implantable cardiac defibrillator to the heart muscle. Function of ICDs Heart rhythm is continuously monitored. A defibrillation shock is automatically delivered when malignant tachyarrhythmias are detected. Overdrive pacing electrically converts a sustained ventricular tachycardia. Backup pacing if bradycardia occurs. Storage of detected arrhythmic events and non-invasive electrophysiologic testing. Malfunction may be due to internal short circuit, memory error, inadequate battery power, etc. Defibrillation waveforms can be divided into monophasic and biphasic. For monophasic waveform, the current pulse travels in the positive direction only. This typically delivers 200 to 360 joules to the myocardium. Examples of monophasic waveforms include exponential decay waveform. There is an exponential decay of current over time. This occurs when there are no inductors in the circuit. Damped sine waveform. This occurs when there is an inductor in the circuit. The waveform is prolonged in duration and adopts a smoother profile. Monophasic waveforms are not preferred for use in modern practice. High thoracic impedance such as in larger patients reduces transmyocardial current when monophasic waveforms are used. Biphasic waveform. The current is reversed halfway through the discharge and moves both in a positive and negative direction. A two-phased current flow occurs. Electrical current flows in one direction for a specified duration, then reverses and flows in the opposite direction. Examples of biphasic waveforms, truncated exponential decay waveform, and rectilinear waveform. Rectilinear biphasic waveforms provide more average current to difficult to defibrillate high impedance patients than other biphasic waveforms. Benefits of biphasic compared to monophasic waveforms. Biphasic shocks are more effective than monophasic shocks in achieving successful defibrillation. One theory suggests that the initial wave polarizes electrodes and the skin, and this reduces impedance to the subsequent wave, allowing more effective and rapid energy delivery to the myocardium. Biphasic defibrillators compensate for the wide variations in transthoracic impedance by electronically adjusting the waveform magnitude and duration. This ensures optimal current delivery to the myocardium irrespective of the patient's size. Biphasic shocks also causes less myocardial injury than monophasic shocks as lower voltages are used, 120 to 200 joules. One possible reason for biphasic superiority is that the peak current flows are lower with biphasic waveforms and this prevents excessive ion translocation across cell membranes in the tissue, the mechanism by which electric shock causes damage. Safety issues of defibrillation includes fire and accidental electrocution. Fires can occur due to ignition of flammable materials by sparks from poorly applied defibrillator pedals in the presence of an oxygen-rich atmosphere. Prevention Avoid defibrillation in an oxygen-enriched atmosphere. Make sure that no oxygen is flowing across the patient's chest or openly across the electrode pads. Use self-adhesive defibrillation pads. Good pad chest wall contact is a must. Gel pads are preferred to electrode paste and gels if manual pedals are used, paste and gels can spread between the two pedals and this may create a spark. Mechanism of electrocution Kindly refer to the video discussing on electrical safety for further details. Prevention of electrocution During charging of pedals, this should occur after being placed on the patient's chest. Do not charge pedals when they are still attached to the defibrillator. Clearing the patient Announce that a shock is about to be delivered such as clear shocking. Inspect that no rescuer team members is in contact with the patient, victim, or resuscitation trolley prior to defibrillator discharge. Preparing the patient for external defibrillation. Electrode or pedal size. Minimum size for both handheld pedal electrodes and self-adhesive pad electrodes in adults should be 150 cm square or 8 to 12 cm in diameter. Defibrillation success may be higher with electrodes of 12 cm in diameter rather than those with 8 cm in diameter. Smaller electrodes such as 4.3 cm are harmful and may cause myocardial necrosis. Electrode or pedal force. Firm pedal pressure should be applied. For adults, the pedal force is 8 kg. For child 1 to 8 years old, 
5kg when using adult pedals. Use gel pads or electrode pedals or self-adhesive pads to reduce trans-thoracic impedance. Ensure that the pedal and gel or pads are in full contact with the skin. Biphasic shocks are more effective than monophasic shocks in achieving successful defibrillation. Can you refer to the previous section for further details? Electrode or pedal placement. Options for defibrillator pedal or electrode placement on the chest or back includes anterior lateral, anterior posterior, anterior left infrascapular, and anterior right infrascapular. Special considerations. Breast. Lateral pads or pedals should be placed under breast tissues. Move pendulous breasts gently out of the way. Wet chest. Wipe the chest dry before attaching electrode pads and attempting defibrillation. Hirsutism. Shave off chest hair prior to application of pads. Automated implanted cardioverter defibrillator. Use anterior posterior and anterolateral locations and avoid placing the pads or pedals over the ICD to avoid its malfunction after defibrillation. Presence of transdermal medication patch, such as nitroglycerin, nicotine, analgesics, hormone replacements, and antihypertensive. Defibrillation electrodes should not be placed over transdermal medication patches, which may block delivery of energy from the electrode pad to the heart and may cause small burns to the skin. These patches should be removed and the area wiped before attaching the electrode pad if defibrillation is required. Steps for external defibrillation Carry out these steps quickly to minimize the time from the last chest compression to shock delivery if resuscitating the patient. The entire sequence should take less than 5 seconds. Avoid pre-shock pause of more than 5 seconds. Even the 5 to 10 second delay will reduce the chances of survival. Adhesive pads reduces delays due to repeated defibrillator electrode placements. These are examples for steps for external defibrillation. Step 1. Attach electrodes to the patient's chest. Step 2. Turn on the defibrillator and select the leads. Step 3. Analyze the rhythm whether it is shockable or not. Step 4. Apply coupling agents or pads to the patient's chest. Step 5. Select appropriate energy level. Step 6. Apply pedals to the chest. Step 7. Charge the pedals. Step 8. The clear chant such as clear shocking, which is a clear warning of the delivery of a shock, and everyone must stand clear of the patient. Step 9. Check the cardiac monitor again and analyze whether the rhythm is a shockable rhythm or not. Step 10. Discharge shock and return the pedals to the machine. When pressing the shock button, the defibrillator operator should face the patient, not the machine, to ensure coordination with the chest compressor and to verify that no one is in contact with the patient during defibrillation. Synchronized cardioversion refers to a shock delivery that is timed or synchronized with the peak deflection of the R wave of ventricular depolarization on the ECG. This is to avoid shock delivery during the relative refractory period of the cardiac cycle when a shock could produce ventricular fibrillation. Synchronized cardioversion is indicated for hemodynamically unstable patients such as with low blood pressure with a perfusing rhythm with arrhythmia such as supraventricular tachycardia due to re-entry, atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter, atrial tachycardia, monomorphic VT with pulses. Synchronized cardioversion is not effective against certain arrhythmias such as junctional tachycardia and multifocal atrial tachycardia. Some arrhythmias may have many QRS configurations and irregular rates such as polymorphic VT. This makes it difficult or impossible to reliably synchronize to a QRS complex. Do not delay shock delivery to perform detailed rhythm analysis if there is any doubt whether monomorphic or polymorphic VT is present in the unstable patient. High energy unsynchronized shocks, i.e. defibrillation doses, 360 Joule for monophasic or 120 to 200 Joule biphasic should be provided instead. Recommended energy level for synchronized cardioversion based on ERC guidelines. For narrow regular tachycardia, such as SPT or atrial flutter, biphasic energy, 70 to 120 joules, monophasic, 100 joules. For narrow irregular tachycardia, such as atrial fibrillation, biphasic, 120 to 150 joules, monophasic, 200 joules. For broad complex tachycardia, such as VT, biphasic, 120 to 150 joules, 
monophasic 200 joule. For monomorphic VT, the dose is biphasic 120 to 150 joule, monophasic 200 joule. Selected clinical scenarios when defibrillation or cardioversion is indicated. Important algorithms relevant to defibrillation and cardioversion. The American Heart Association Adult Cardiac Arrest Algorithm 2015. Ensure the safety of the patient and yourself. Start CPR for a patient who is unresponsive and has no signs of life. Shout for help. Call resuscitation team and bring defibrillator. Note the time. Give oxygen and attach monitor or defibrillator. Analyze that whether the rhythm is shockable or not. If the rhythm is shockable, such as VF or pulseless VT, deliver shock. The shock energy for defibrillation for biphasic follow manufacturer recommendation. It is typically 120 to 200 joule. If unknown, use the maximum available. Second and subsequent doses should be equivalent and higher doses may be considered. The monophasic dose is 360 joule. After the shock, provide CPR for 2 minutes, obtain IV or IO access. After 2 minutes, assess again whether the rhythm is shockable or not. If it is shockable, provide the shock. After the shock, provide CPR for another 2 minutes, give adrenaline every 3 to 5 minutes, consider advanced airway and capnography. After CPR of 2 minutes, assess again whether the rhythm is shockable or not. If it is shockable, provide the shock and continue CPR for another 2 minutes. Give a mildaron and treat reversible causes. If the rhythm is not shockable and there are no signs of ROSC, go to steps 10 or 11. If ROSC, go to post cardiac arrest care. If the rhythm is not shockable, such as AC stall or PEA, provide CPR for 2 minutes, obtain IV or IO access, give adrenaline every 3 to 5 minutes, consider advanced airway and capnography. After CPR of 2 minutes, Assess if the rhythm is shockable or not. If it is shockable, go to steps 5 or 7. If it is not, provide CPR for 2 minutes and treat reversible causes. Ensure high CPR quality. Push hard with a depth of more than 5 cm and fast, 100 to 120 per minute, and allow complete chest recoil. Minimize interruptions in compressions. Avoid excessive ventilation. Rotate compressor every 2 minutes or sooner if fatigued. If no advanced airway, 30 to 2 compression to ventilation ratio. Attempt to improve CPR quality if ETCO2 is less than 10 mmHg and if relaxation phase diastolic pressure is less than 20 mmHg. The dose for adrenaline, IV or IO is 1 mg every 3 to 5 minutes. The dose for amiodarone, IV or IO for the first dose, 300 mg bolus, second dose, 150 mg bolus. Advanced airway includes endotracheal intubation or supraglottic advanced airway, waveform capnography or capnometry to confirm and monitor ET tube placement. Once advanced airway is in place, give one breath every 6 seconds or 10 breaths per minute with continuous chest compressions. Return of spontaneous circulation ROSC, is based on pulse and blood pressure measurement, abrupt sustained increase in ETCO2 typically more than 40 mmHg, and spontaneous arterial pressure waves with intra-arterial pressure monitoring. The reversible causes that should be treated includes 5H and 5T. 5H includes hypovolemia, hypoxia, hydrogen ion, acidosis, hypo or hyperkalemia, and hypothermia. 5Ts includes tension pneumothorax, tamponade, cardiac, toxins, thrombosis pulmonary, and thrombosis coronary. Tachycardia Algorithm with Pulse ERC 2015 Guidelines Assess using the ABCDE approach. Give oxygen if appropriate. Obtain IV access. Monitor ECG, BP, SpO2, and 12 lead ECG. Identify and treat reversible causes such as electrolyte abnormalities. Assess for evidence of adverse signs such as shock, syncope, myocardial ischemia, and heart failure. If present, provide synchronized DC shock up to 3 attempts. If arrhythmia is still present, provide amildaron 300 mg IV over 10 to 20 minutes and repeat shock, followed by amildaron 900 mg over 24 hours. Attempted electrical cardioversion on conscious patients is always undertaken under adequate sedation or general anesthesia. 
the doses for synchronized DC shock have been mentioned in the previous section. If the patient is stable, check that if the QRS is narrow, less than 0.12 seconds or not. If it is a broad QRS complex, check that if the QRS complexes are regular or not. If the QRS complexes are broad and irregular, seek expert help. Possibilities include AF with bundle branch block, treat as for narrow complex, or polymorphic VT such as torsades depons, give magnesium 2 gram over 10 minutes. If the QRS complexes are broad and regular, it could be ventricular tachycardia. The treatment is amiodarone 300 mg IV over 20 to 60 minutes, followed by 900 mg over 24 hours. If previously confirmed SVT with bundle branch block, give adenosine as for regular narrow complex tachycardia. If the QRS complexes are narrow and regular, give vagal maneuvers, adenosine 6 mg rapid IV bolus. If unsuccessful, give 12 mg. If still unsuccessful, give a further 12 mg. Monitor ECG continuously. If normal sinus rhythm is restored, it is probably re-entry paroxysmal SVT. Record 12 lead ECG in sinus rhythm. If recurse, give adenosine again and consider choice of antiarrhythmic prophylaxis. If normal sinus rhythm is not restored, seek expert help, possibly atrial flutter, control rate with beta blocker. If the QRS complexes are narrow and irregular, it is probably atrial fibrillation, control rate with beta blocker or dutazem, consider digoxin or amiodarone if evidence of heart failure, anticoagulate if the duration of AF is more than 48 hours. This algorithm helps with identifying the type of tachyarrhythmia. If the heart rate is more than 100 beats per minute, check if the QRS complexes are narrow or broad. For narrow QRS complexes, check that if it is regular or irregular rhythm. If it is regular rhythm and uniform P waves are present, it is sinus tachycardia. If it is regular narrow complex and no P waves are present, it is paroxysmal SVT. If regular narrow complex QRS complex tachycardia with sawtooth waves, it is atrial flutter. If there is irregular rhythm narrow QRS complexes and non-uniform P waves, it is multifocal atrial tachycardia. If fibrillation waves are present for irregular narrow complex tachycardia, it is atrial fibrillation. For white QRS complex tachycardia and with regular rhythm with AV dissociation or fusion beats, it is ventricular tachycardia. If there are irregular rhythm white complex tachycardia, it is SVT with prolonged AV conduction. Supraventricular tachycardia. This is a type of narrow QRS complex tachycardia that is second only to atrial fibrillation as the most prevalent rhythm disturbance in the general population. Mechanism. Re-entrant tachycardia formation. SVTs occur when impulse transmission in one pathway of the AV conduction system is slow. A difference in the refractory period or impulse transmission in the abnormal and normal conduction pathways is formed. Impulses travelling down one pathway then travels back through the other pathway. A circular pattern of impulse transmission that is self-sustaining occurs, which involves retrograde transmission of impulses. Re-entry or retrograde transmission of impulses is triggered by an ectopic atrial impulse in one of the two conduction pathways. Paroxysmal SVT can be classified based on the location of the re-entrant pathway. AV nodal re-entrant tachycardia. Of the five types of paroxysmal SVT, the most common is AV nodal re-entrant tachycardia, AVNRT, and accounts for 50 to 60% of cases of PSVT. The re-entrant pathway is located in the AV node. Clinical features of SVT. AVNRT typically appears in young adults without structural cardiac disease, and more than 60% of cases are in women. Onset is abrupt. Heart rate is typically 180 to 200 beats per minute, but can range from 110 to more than 250 beats per minute in certain individuals. Hemodynamic instability is uncommon. ECG shows narrow QRS complex tachycardia. P waves are not seen. Heart rate typically more than 150 beats per minute. Rhythm is regular. Electrical management. Synchronized cardioversion is recommended for cases of SVT that are hemodynamically unstable refractory to pharmacologic agents, biphasic energy dose is 70 to 120 joules, 
monophasic energy dose is 100 joules. Ventricular tachycardia. Features. Monomorphic VT. The ECG shows a white QRS complex tachycardia. QRS complexes are uniform. There is regular ventricular rate. The heart rate is typically above 100 beats per minute. It is usually 140 to 200 beats per minute. Some superimposed P waves may be seen. It has an abrupt onset. It rarely occurs in the absence of structural heart disease. Polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. ECG shows a heart rate of 150 to 250 beats per minute with multiple QRS morphologies. QRS complexes appears to be twisting around the isoelectric line of the ECG. QT interval is prolonged. Ventricular rhythm is irregular. Tausate depons can be congenital or acquired. The latter is much more common. Predisposing factors for Tausate depons include drugs such as antiarrhythmics, quinidine, disopyramide, procainamide, ibutilide, sotalol, etc. Antimicrobials such as clarithromycin, erythromycin, and pentamidine, etc. Neuroleptics such as clopromazine, thioridazine, droperidol, and haloperidol. And other drugs such as cisapride and methadone. Electrolyte abnormalities can also predispose to tausate depots such as hypomagnesemia, hypokalemia, and hypocalcemia. Distinguishing monomorphic VT versus SVT. Two abnormalities on an ECG will identify monomorphic VT, AV dissociation, and fusion beats. AV dissociation, i.e. no fixed relationship between P waves and QRS complexes, provides evidence of ventricular tachycardia. This is more likely to be discovered on a 12-lead ECG rather than on a single-lead tracing. P waves are most visible in the inferior limb leads and anterior precordial leads. Fusion beats provides evidence for ventricular tachycardia. Fusion beats is produced by the retrograde transmission of a ventricular ectopic impulse that collides with a supraventricular impulse. A hybrid QRS complex is formed, which is a mixture of a normal QRS complex and the ventricular ectopic impulse. Electrical management of VT. If pulseless VT treat as for VF, unsynchronized biphasic defibrillation 120 to 200 joules, or unsynchronized monophasic defibrillation 360 joules. If there is evidence of hemodynamic compromise but pulse is still present, provide synchronized biphasic cardioversion, regardless of whether the rhythm is VT or SVT with aberrant conduction. The energy of the initial shock should be according to the manufacturer's suggestion. If not available, maximum energy shocks, such as 200 joules for biphasic shocks, should be considered. The typical dose is biphasic energy 120 to 150 joules or monophasic 200 joules. For unstable polymorphic VT with or without a pulse, treat as VF using defibrillation doses. If unstable monomorphic VT with a pulse, Treat with either synchronized biphasic waveform cardioversion 120 to 150 joules or synchronized monophasic waveform cardioversion 200 joules. If the initial shock fails, increase the dose in a stepwise fashion. For witnessed and monitored patient with VF or pulseless VT, where manual defibrillator is rapidly available, such as in catheter lab, coronary care unit, or critical care area, provide three quick and successive stacked shocks. Chest compressions is unlikely to improve the already very high chance of ROSC when defibrillation occurs early in the electrical phase, immediately after onset of VF. If this initial 3 shock strategy is unsuccessful, the ALS algorithm should be followed and these 3 shocks are treated as the first single shock given. Atrial fibrillation The sinus impulse is normally conducted evenly and concentrically to all parts of the atria and then to the ventricles in a healthy heart. Kindly refer to the video on cardiac conduction system for further details. In atrial fibrillation, excitation and recovery of different parts of the atria becomes uncoordinated. Various areas are at different stages of excitation and recovery. Causes of AF includes ischemic heart disease, acute critical illness, particularly sepsis, mitral stenosis, tyrotoxicosis, major surgery, myocarditis, pericarditis, pulmonary embolism, etc. The ECG shows irregularly irregular rhythm, absent P waves, absent isoelectric baseline, variable ventricular rate,
Fermi's complexes are usually less than 0.12 seconds. Fibrillatory waves may mimic P waves, leading to misdiagnosis. Effects of AF There will be reduced ventricular filling due to loss of atrial contractions, which normally contributes 25% of ventricular and diastolic volume. Tachycardia reduces diastolic filling time. The risk of thromboembolism is substantially increased if AF lasts more than 48 hours. Thrombi formed in the left atrium can dislodge and embolize to cause an acute ischemic stroke. Electrical management of atrial fibrillation. Refractory AF may be treated with DC cardioversion synchronized to the peak deflection of the R wave of ventricular depolarization on the ECG to avoid triggering ventricular fibrillation. The dose is biphasic 120 to 150 joules or monophasic 200 joules. DC cardioversion is indicated when AF is associated with hypotension, pulmonary edema, myocardial ischemia, and when AF is a re-entrant rhythm involving an accessory pathway. Biphasic shocks are recommended if immediate cardioversion is required and the duration of AF is more than 48 hours or is unknown, anticoagulate with heparin as soon as possible and continue with oral agents for at least 4 weeks. Ventricular fibrillation Excitation and recovery of different parts of the ventricle becomes uncoordinated. Various areas are at different stages of excitation and recovery. The changing amplitude of the ECG reflects the chaotic electrical activity. Causes of ventricular fibrillation include myocardial disease such as ischemic or myopathic myocardial disease, hypoxia, profound hypothermia, electrolyte imbalances, electrocution, certain drugs, etc. The ECG shows chaotic irregular deflections of varying amplitude. P waves, QRS complexes or T waves are not identifiable. Heart rate is typically 150 to 500 beats per minute. Amplitude of complexes decreases with duration. Cross VF becomes fine VF. Effects Depolarization is chaotic. The ventricle is unable to generate any cardiac output. Hemodynamic compromise occurs. Electrical management Can be either mechanical defibrillation or electrical defibrillation. Mechanical defibrillation, also known as precordial thumb, may convert VF to a viable rhythm only if it is applied very early. However, precordial thumb achieves only 5 to 10 joules of mechanical energy and the chances of success is very low. Electrical defibrillation The dose is typically unsynchronized biphasic defibrillation 120 to 200 joules or unsynchronized monophasic defibrillation 360 joules. As the defibrillator delivers a charge across the chest Simultaneous depolarization of myocardial cells occurs. A short refractory period is created, after which there is resumption of normal pacemaker activity with myocardial contraction and a stable rhythm if the defibrillation is successful. Refibrillation versus refractory VF For refibrillation, recurrence of VF during a documented cardiac arrest episode occurs. It occurs after initial termination of VF. The patient should be treated with defibrillation using escalating energy levels. Refractory VF occurs when fibrillation persists after three defibrillation shocks. A Mildaron 300 mg bolus followed with infusion of 900 mg over 24 hours should be given. A Mildaron 150 mg may be given after 300 mg bolus if VF is still not resolved. The maximum daily dose for adults is 2.2 grams for a Mildaron. These are my references. Thank you.